So good evening everybody or good afternoon for those not in the same time zone. I'm going to do my best to summarise Emma Dabiri's What White People Can Do Next, but it's it's a short book, but it is full, full, full of what white people can do next and strategies and challenges to us. So this is very much a, as in-depth a summary as I can do, but I really recommend that everyone read it for themselves. And I hope after you've heard and seen this presentation, you will feel inspired to read it. So first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about Emma Dabiri herself. You say her name exactly as Adrian said. The emphasis is on the first syllable, Dabiri. Then I'm going to reflect on the six challenges or strategies which she suggests white people adopt. And I'm going to mention a few things that occurred to me as I read the book and made my notes. Then I'm going to reflect on her suggestions for what white people can do next. And then her suggestions for moving from allyship to coalition. Many of my slides are direct quotes from Dabiri's book. So to begin at the beginning with Emma Dabiri. She is a teaching fellow at the African Department of SOAS. She's a visual sociology PhD researcher at Goldsmiths on the construction of racial categories. Her first book, What White People Can Do Next, is her second book, but her first book was called Don't Touch My Hair, and it was an Irish Times bestseller. She has presented television and radio programmes, including the BBC Radio 4 documentary Journeys into Afrofuturism Afro in Arts and Music. And when she was seven, instead of attending her first Holy Communion with her classmates in Ireland, where she was born and brought up, she made what she described as a spiffy little anti-slavery pamphlet called Break the Chains, and she presented it to her teachers. She says, as soon as you start reading black history, it's difficult not to become politicized. There are fundamentally eight main sections in the book. The first six are the strategies or challenges to white people. The seventh is the section which suggests what we can do and the eighth is how we might move from allyship to coalition. So the six strategies she recommends to us white people and by the way when I say we and our I mean white people because this book is addressed to white people and I am a white person. So Dabiri's first suggestion to us white people is to stop the denial of our racism. Her next suggestion is for us to stop the false equivalencies. So when in a discussion about racism, a white person says, but what about poor white people? It's a false equivalence because white people do not suffer racism, however bad their circumstances otherwise. Her third suggestion is that we interrogate whiteness, ask ourselves what it means, what does whiteness mean? Her fourth is that we interrogate capitalism. She says that any anti-racist or allyship initiative that disregards capitalist imperatives is highly unlikely to enjoy success. I'm going to go into each of these in much more detail as we go through the presentation. Her fifth strategy or challenge to us white people is that we denounce the white savior. And her sixth is that we abandon guilt. Then 
she suggests some things we can do and then she talks about how we might move from allyship to coalition so to begin at the beginning Dabiri recommends that we stop the denial of our racism. Over the centuries, white people have been socialized to believe that on some level, we are superior to black and racially minoritized people. And so we can't possibly be immune from racism. We may feel and think that we are, but subconsciously, because we've been brought up in this climate, we cannot be immune from racism. We've internalized negative and reductive assumptions associated with blackness and generally positive ones associated with whiteness. And we need to do everything we can to recognize, unearth, and eradicate these subconsciously internalized racist assumptions. We need fundamentally to admit our racism. Nova Reed, who I'm sure many of you know, or at least know about, who is a black activist, teacher, and writer, in her anti-racism course, which she runs, where she interviewed some of her students, most of whom are white. And one of her white students, when Nova was interviewing her, suggested that we white people could think of racism, our racism, in the way that recovering alcoholics address their alcoholism. In other words, that racism is in our DNA, this student suggested. But if we think of ourselves as recovering racists, the way recovering alcoholics think of themselves as recovering, it might, she suggested, help us be vigilant and constantly and consciously aware of our racism. And every day, just as a recovering alcoholic refuses to drink, we could refuse to act on that racism. In her book, The Good Ally, Nova Reed suggests four fundamental steps to aspiring white allies that we can take towards anti-racism. She suggests that we listen, actively listen, and that we unlearn and then relearn before attempting any kind of responsive action as we work towards becoming allies. She also suggests that anti-racism work is about collective healing. The second of Dabiri's suggestions or challenges to white people to adopt in our anti-racism journey is to stop the false equivalences. In a rap on race, when James Baldwin talked about slavery, Margaret Mead said that her Scottish ancestors were hunted in Scotland and tortured. But as Dabiri writes, Mead's legacy of historic injustice is not killing her now. This conversation, a rap on race, happened in 1971. James Baldwin, as I'm sure you know, is a black novelist and essayist, now dead. Margaret Mead was a white anthropologist. The thing is that if somebody says in a conversation about anti-racism, what about the prejudice that poor white people face? In terms of racism, that is a falsely equivalent question they may be living in very difficult circumstances, but they don't suffer racism. It is a false equivalence. Baldwin replied to Mead when she talked about her Scottish ancestors. He said lots of groups have prejudicial attitudes, 
the damage is done when that prejudice is shored up by power. Power, people with power make laws and they make the legislative differences between, in this case, in racism's case, life and death. For, for instance, the legal system in which race and race, racism were codified into law, such as the legislation that legally enslaved Africans and treated them as chattel, legally. Jabiru wants us to think about how a vast array of oppressions or forms of disadvantage might have a common origin in order to identify ways of coalition building that can focus on the source of the problem while remaining mindful of the different textures of our varied but interconnected struggles. The third of her strategies or challenges to us white people is to interrogate our own whiteness. The concept of a white race and a black race is a socially engineered concept. It was invented with the specific intention, racism. Racial categories were invented to enshrine the idea of white supremacy. Naming whiteness is necessary. It is the invisibility of white people who are presented just as people, the default norm from which everyone else deviates, that is part of whiteness's normative power making. James Baldwin wrote that all Europeans have a deadly temptation to feel a sense of biological superiority. But biological superiority clearly isn't a truth. In Keenan Malik's book, Not So Black and White, he writes that racial categories were established at the same time as slavery to dehumanize black slaves and so justify white slaveholding and maltreatment. Dabiri writes that whiteness can be a refusal or inability to recognize basic human connections. She says you must be able to recognize another's humanity in order fully to experience your own. She also said at the Edinburgh Literary Festival in February 2022 when she was talking about her book What White People Can Do Next, I don't want to give white people tips on how better to recognize my humanity. She says what would be truly radical would be to sound the death knell for the fiction that white people constitute a race and that this race is imbued with any natural abilities unavailable to others. In our breakout rooms, we're going to reflect on three different questions, which Adrian will remind us of and actually post in the breakout rooms when we get there. But the first of these questions will be to reflect on our whiteness. A question that asks if white people are a relatively modern invention, who were white people before they were white, before race? was invented. The fourth of Dabiri's strategies or challenges to us white people is to interrogate capitalism. As I said at the beginning, she wrote that any anti-racist or allyship initiative that disregards capitalism and capitalist imperatives is highly unlikely to enjoy success. We exist in a, in a system that has inequality and exploitation hardwired into it. Interrogating capitalism is a huge sub subject, but there are people working on different ideas from the growth based economic system that has informed our economics for so long. Heather McGee, a black American economist, writes in her book, The Sum of Us, 
that the things that affect black people badly economically, and she's specifically talking about the states, but it's true everywhere. The things that affect black people badly economically also affect white people just as badly. She, Dabiri quotes Fred Moten, a black philosopher, essayist and poet who writes, white people need to recognize that this shit, racism, is killing you too, us too, white people. It's in all our interest to change our economic systems. Dabiri suggests that one way of addressing and interrogating capitalism is to redistribute wealth. One of the ways is reparations. Tanahazi Coates and in the US and Kenneth Mohammed in the UK are both campaigning for reparations for the descendants of slaves. When abolition happened, slave owners were compensated financially for the loss of their slaves. Descendants of slaves have never been compensated. Another possible economic change would be windfall taxes. There's a suggestion in the States uh, where there's an attempt to bring a law in. It's not yet become law, but there are still petitions for it to become law. Um, whereby during the first year of COVID, wealthy tech uh, titans be subjected to a windfall tax during that first year on the um, accumulation in their investments, the interest in their, the growth of their investments. So not on wages or salaries, but on invested wealth. If this act ever became law, Elon Musk, for instance, would pay a one-off wealth tax of 27.5 billion American dollars. Jeff Bezos would pay a one-off wealth tax of 42.8 billion dollars just for one year. And this money would go towards helping working Americans cover healthcare costs. So there are plenty of ideas out there. Other ideas include, from our point of view, joining or working for or supporting organizations that work for social and financial justice and equity in this country. There are many of these. Three examples are the Resolution Foundation, the Runnymede Trust and the Equality Trust. The fifth of Dabiri's strategies or challenges to us white people is to denounce the white saviour. Teju Cole, a Nigerian American writer, photographer and art historian, writes that originally the term white saviour was used to define a white person who acts to help non-white people in a self-serving way. Later, the term evolved to include those who began to embody this whiteness by placing their experience above the experiences of the individual or the community that they thought they were helping. White saviors, Dabiri writes, might think they're being good people, but black people don't need charity, benevolence or indeed guilt. It's unhelpful and patronizing. Dabiri writes that it seems a huge tactical error to frame anti-racism as a petition to the kindness or better nature of a good or selfless person. As such, she writes, allyship appeals to a desire to help a victim and that increases the power imbalance and of itself creates white saviors. She says the white savior can only exist because of the power imbalance generated by white supremacy. So it's paradoxical. The white savior is embedded in the foundational logic of the construction of the white race. Coalition, on the other hand, is about mutuality 
and we need to shift the focus away from the good individual and their personal privilege to challenging racist systems. We need to organize to create substantive change and to develop just systems. The key is to detach ourselves from the superiority that is encoded into being racialized as white and to act from that equal place. The second question that we will address in our breakout rooms is, to what extent do you fall into the trap of thinking allyship is about desiring to help a victim rather than something more mutual, something that we would all benefit from by challenging racist systems? Dabiri's sixth strategy or challenge to us white people is to abandon guilt. Audre Lorde, who described herself as black, lesbian, mother, warrior and poet, writes in Sister Outsider, her collection of essays and speeches, I have no creative use for guilt, yours or my own. Guilt is only another way of avoiding informed action. Dabiri writes, white people are not responsible for what our ancestors did. We are, however, responsible for what we do now. In her Edinburgh Literary Festival interview in February 2022 about this book, Dabiri suggested that we white people should ditch the hand wringing of guilt and adopt the hand holding of solidarity. Toward the end of what white people can do next, Dabiri suggests some things that we can do. To quote Heather McGee again from her book, The Some of Us, when desegregation began in the US in the late 1940s, white people were encouraged to share public facilities with black people. One such public facility was public swimming pools. But when black people began to swim in these public pools, white people began to stay away. And eventually, despite the fact that everyone was paying taxes to fund these pools, in Montgomery, Alabama, and many other places, white city councillors agreed to drain the pools and cover them over to the detriment of everyone. Everyone was paying taxes for these pools. Everyone should have been able to enjoy them. But white people began to stay away and complain, and the pools were made useless to everyone. McGee writes, the impulse to exclude now manifests in subtler ways, more often reflected in the pool of resources as opposed to an actual literal swimming pool. Dabiri suggests ways to educate ourselves about racism, ways to change the ways we think, ways the pool of resources might be shared and how our attitudes to that pool might shift and change. She says we need to do things differently it is a matter of urgency that we craft responses to racism that don't reinforce a reinvestment in racial categories. The first thing she suggests we do is to read and read and read and to use reading as a portal to other forms of action. She suggests reading fiction and she particularly recommends James Baldwin and Toni Morrison for profound truths about the human condition. But there are many, many, many black authors of fiction, as I'm sure you know. She suggests that we read theory, the post-colonial writers, Franz Fanon and Wolye Soinka in particular. Dabiri herself found them revelatory. She suggests that we read up on the black radical tradition on ways to create a more just system. There are many writers in this tradition and not all of them are black. In her February interview at the Edinburgh Liter Literary Festival, 
Dabi Rhee said, the black radical tradition is so much more expansive and exciting than mainstream anti-racist discourse. Some more things that white people can do, Dabi Rhee suggests, are dance. She says, Listen to music for its potential to undermine the predominantly visual regimes of whiteness and racism. The most profound expressions of freedom are found in roots reggae, dub, jazz, 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 techno, house, hip hop, and many others. Emma Goldwyn, who was a 19th century Russian born American political activist, said that a revolution without dancing is not a revolution worth having. As we've heard under interrogating capitalism, Dabi Rhee suggests, we find ways to redistribute resources. We need policies and programs and incentives. We should vote at elections for those committed to addressing inequality and think about the things we were just talking about under interrogating capitalism. We need to recognize that this shit is killing us too, as Fred Moten wrote. When our struggles against inequality and racial injustice or in pursuit of environmental justice are atomized or broken up, our mutuality is obscured. We need to find common ground between all people. We need to pull people up, other white people up on their racism. There is a white American psychology professor called Mark Maluga, who I know and we belong to an anti-racist group, which is mostly based in the States. When he encounters a racist remark, or when he hears a racist remark as part of a conversation that he is part of, he will say, I'm curious to know more about that or can you tell me more? Can you tell me what you mean by that? And he finds that that quite often disarms and it's certainly not aggressive. So it tends not to deteriorate into an argument or a shouting match. It can appreciate into a conversation. And that we need to stop reducing black people to one dimension. Dabi rewrites, like all human beings, black people are motivated by a whole range of human emotion and not all these motivations will be altruistic. To imagine otherwise is dehumanizing. In our attempts to move from allyship to coalition or to remain as allies but think about coalition, Dabi rewrites that Racism shuts down the possibility of working together. If we believe in differences based on race, we make it very difficult to work together, to consider each other equal as human beings. Effective movement building demands that we identify shared goals while remaining alert to the specifics of racism and how they show up differently in different contexts. We need to come together to address common intersectional issues as human beings, as opposed to trying to redress perceived differences invented and caused by racism. But we seem to have replaced doing anything with saying something and very often online. We need to do things. Dabiri asks us to think holistically, to identify common ground that all of us can strive for and all benefit from, to find organisations that already exist and support them, to begin our own organisations as we move from allyship to coalition. What we require, Dabiri writes, is not so much an understanding of an intersectionality of identities, but an intersectionality of issues as we move from allyship to coalition. Linking our struggles together 
is the work of coalition building, a vision wherein many people can see their interests identified and come together for a common good. Dabiri suggests that we should identify common ground, but that common ground should be multiracial and we should recognize, as we've heard before, that what is bad for black and brown and yellow people is just as bad for white people. We need to work together. She cites in the book Extinction Rebellion's um, way of using citizens' assemblies to come together and discuss ideas and formulate ways forward. She tells us that on Extinction Rebellion's website, there is a, a quite detailed um, description of how to form a citizen's assembly. The third question we will address in our breakout rooms will be how and where can we find and connect with fellow anti-racist travellers to find common ground, the intersectionality of issues and form anti-racist coalitions. So to recap, these are the six strategies or challenges to white people. And then we've seen some things that we can do and I'm sure we can build on those. And then we've seen ways, beginnings of ways to move from allyship to coalition. And I'd like to leave you with a final quote from the book. Dabiri writes, we don't all have to look the same to identify common interests and perhaps unexpected affinities, to cultivate kinships that cut across divisions intended to weaken us in order to better exploit us. At the end of the book, Dabiri writes, I want something fundamentally to have changed by the time you have finished this book, something that will stop us from having this conversation again 10 or 20 years from now. There's so much in this book and I've only managed to give you a brief summary, but it is a beginning and I hope it's given us all much to think about. <laughs>